Welcome to the 2021 ordination service. I'm Dave Kirsten. I'm the Dean at North Park Theological Seminary, and I'm the Vice President for Church Relations for North Park University. It is my pleasure to welcome you and to greet you in behalf of President Surridge and the entire faculty and staff of all schools here, and particularly our seminary, and, uh, and to um, also, also welcome you in behalf of our church. The great partnership between North Park and the church dates back to 1891, and we are delighted. We're delighted to come to you from Anderson Chapel and to come to you from the most diverse urban neighborhood in the world, uh, where the world is at our footsteps. So our sons and our daughters will, will receive prayer and the laying on of hands, and, and a stool will be placed on them in this service. For me, this service represents, this service represents a, a, a theme of deep calling and promise. The, the church promised and invested in each, each of these ordinance, forming them, educating them, and, and then they are going to call forth a promise. They are going to ask them to, to kneel and to promise and to speak vows and to receive a stole of their calling, yoking them to the promises they have made here this evening. It's a beautiful service. It's a high and holy moment. For me, that theme of promise is, is really all that matters. It's what's held me in uh, nearly 40 years of ordained ministry, that I spoke a promise, that I said no matter what, I, I would be there and I would stay true to my calling. And I, 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 I rely on that daily. And so will these, your sons and daughters, will rely on this moment, this moment of great promise. Once again, I say welcome to you. Welcome to the service of ordination. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to this service of worship. This is a high and holy moment in the life of the church, a service of consecration, commissioning, and ordination. I want to acknowledge that this is a historic service. The covenant has always bestowed permanent credentials on its ministers in person at its annual meeting. However, this year, we have discerned that a virtual service is necessary as we are all still coming through this pandemic. Although we are participating virtually, our prayer is that this service will be memorable, unifying, and beautiful for all who participate. Although we cannot be together in person, we are together through God's Spirit. In this service, we will be celebrating the finalization credentials for 99 ministers. This number includes those who completed their requirements in 2021 and those who completed their requirements in 2022. All of them are participating in this service from a variety of settings. Some are participating in conference-sponsored events with conference staff and local colleagues in attendance. Some are participating from home churches and circled around with friends and family and local church leadership alongside. Some are participating from their homes. All settings are special and appropriate. Although we lament that we cannot be in person together for the service, we rejoice that for many of us, this virtual service allows the presence and participation of friends and family who otherwise would not have been able to witness this sacred event. Every candidate for consecration, commissioning, and ordination will speak their vows from wherever they are. When the time comes for the laying on of hands in prayer, an ordained person will physically lay hands on the candidates as a sign that they are being set apart to be servants of the Word of God. These rites do not impart the Holy Spirit to these candidates for the first time nor do they impart an indelible character. However, there is a pervading mystery of the Spirit's presence at work. For in these rites, Almighty God is at work. 
the sovereign creator and redeemer, Jesus Christ, who is the good news of the gospel, the Holy Spirit who quickens, sustains, and empowers us. Welcome as we worship the Lord. Let us join together in the singing of the hymn. God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and your greater glory. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. 
The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father, Father of, of majesty, majesty unbounded, true and only Son, worthy of all praise, and Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you took our flesh to set us free, you humbly chose the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe you will come to be our judge. Come, come then, then, Lord, Lord and, and help, help your, your people, people, bought with, with the, the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory, glory everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Our second reading is from the New Testament in Luke chapter 12, verse 49 to 60, 56. I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish it were already burning. I have terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I'm under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No. I have come to divide people against each other. From now on, families will be split apart, three in favor of me and two against, or two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, when you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower and you are right. When the south winds blow, you say, today will be the scatter and it is, you fools. You know how to interpret the weather signs on the earth and the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the present times. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If there's anything we have learned in this last year is that life can throw us unexpected challenges. Sometimes these challenges give us headaches, sometimes they cost us financially, and sometimes, you know, sometimes they can be absolutely catastrophic, far beyond the ability of anyone to carry on. The Minister's Care and Crisis Fund helps us care for pastors' personal needs, and these include health care, counseling, and emergency home repairs. Now, if a relative came to me and asked for help, I'd do it. And if a friend came and asked me for help, I'd probably do it. The, in the covenant, the ministerium is made up of our friends and family. We are deeply grateful for the generosity of our ministry partners, staff, and donors who make this form of relief possible. In the last 12 months, the Minister's Care and Crisis Fund has given out uh, up to $94,000 to pastors in deep need. We are grateful for your financial partnership and continued support of this ministry. We invite you today to participate with us in our offering for the Minister's Care and Crisis Fund. You may give by going to www.covchurchgiving.com 
and then click on the Minister's Care and Crisis Fund or mail a check to Covenant Offices at 8303 West Higgins Road, Chicago, Illinois, 60631. Now my kids tell me if you're on an iPad or a cell phone, you can do a quick screenshot and get those addresses. This year has depleted most of the funds and there is a big need to get them replenished, so please give. As we collect that offering virtually tonight, let's pray. Giver of all good gifts, in times of plenty and in times of need, know that we are thankful for your work in our lives. Would you touch hearts, connect those able to help financially through the Care and Crisis Fund with those who have deep need? And those in deep need within the ministry and are at the end of their rope, may you work in ways that bring fullness of life and restoration to those who serve your church so that they can do so without having to look back over their shoulders. In advance, we thank you for what you will do through your people. Amen. I'd like you to join me in welcoming our speaker for this hour, this ordination service, the Reverend Dr. Catherine Gilliard. She serves as superintendent of the Southeast Conference and has lived in Georgia for over 40 years. She accepted Christ and grew in her leadership as a youth member of Oakdale Covenant Church in Chicago, Illinois, under the Reverend Dr. Willie B. Jemison, senior pastor. Catherine holds an MDiv and a DMIN from North Park Theological Seminary and also serves as an adjunct professor in the Covenant Orient Orientation Program. She also currently serves as the liaison from the Council of Superintendents to the Board of Ordered Ministry. She and her husband, Derek, have been married for 42 years and they have three adult children, Adam, Dominique, and Veronica, and an adopted son, Jamal. Catherine is an ordained covenant pastor who writes and teaches on being intentional about how discipleship, evangelism, formation, advocacy, and justice form our witness as those who follow Christ. Again, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Catherine Gilliard. I want to begin by thanking Executive Minister Lance Davis and President Don Winrick for this invitation to preach. Today I come with questions and I invite you to ponder with me what they mean for all of us who have been called to lead in this season. Each of you have written about your ability to lead well, teach well, preach well, and care well. You've been able to clearly articulate the covenant's six affirmations, our biblical understanding of our sacraments, human sexuality, God's calling of women in ministry, and the use of the six-fold test in our mission. You've completed academic requirements or equivalency plans, met with advisors, spent many hours in prayer, all to discern whether or not the covenant is the body through which God has called you to minister. Some of you have completed all of these assignments last year and have waited patiently for this moment, and it is finally here. I too have struggled with this message, not quite knowing how to speak a word that will bear fruit in this season. So here we all are, all brought together for this moment, wondering what will happen as the Holy Spirit begins to do her work in, through, and among us. I love a good mystery, the unknown becoming known and the invisible becoming visible. I am drawn to clues that are visible to everyone, and yet they go unnoticed because they haven't been connected to this plot. Without knowing what's going on with the main characters, we often miss opportunities to connect clues in meaningful ways. We don't yet understand how these clues enhance our understanding or even know if they're important to the case. A good mystery will draw attention away from the important clues 
and introduce diversions and distractions to provide, that really provide little information to help us uncover the motive for the mystery. Jesus instructs his disciples to pay attention and to connect the clues, especially that help us interpret this present time. Today, as you take your ordination vows, the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit will be evident as you are sent out to lead, to teach, to preach, and to care for the most vulnerable among us. Those entrusted to your care will learn how to, to interpret the times from your preaching and teaching. There are clues everywhere to help us understand the mystery of our present time, but you will be the one sent out to connect the dots. Please take your vows seriously and do your own work intentionally. Ella Baker says, give light and people will find the way. We don't send you out to provide answers for people unmotivated to do their own work. You're being sent out to move our global conversation from debate and meaningless dialogue to places of understanding and clarity on how we've arrived at this chaos moment. When you name what you name and what you leave unnamed in your preaching and teaching will shape and form those in your care. How you embody care for others will be the witness of how people believe Christ cares. So we take clues from Jesus on how we live into our core competencies as ordained and commissioned members of our clergy. When Jesus preaches his first sermon in Luke 4, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to announce the captives should be released and the blind shall see, that the downtrodden be set free from their oppressors and God is ready to give blessings to all who come to him. From the beginning, Jesus addresses poverty and healthcare and systemic injustices. As God's ambassadors, you are being sent out to teach others how to embody discipleship practices until they can do what Jesus did for and with the same people that Jesus did them with in the same ways that Jesus did them. Jesus tells his disciples, do you think I came to give peace to the earth? No, I tell you, I came to divide it. Remember that you are being sent out to not to coordinate programs, but to turn everything right side up. Jeremiah 23 reminds us, does not my word burn like fire? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashed the rocks to pieces? Allow the word of God to shape and transform you and those you will care for. Hebrews 4 reminds us that God's word is alive and working. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones, and it judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. Your hearts will be on full display as you pastor and lead ministries. Use spiritual practices daily. They will help guard you against the worldly practices of competition, greed, and empire building. These will creep in when you pastor churches you did not build, provide leadership in organizations you were not formed by, or create pathways to places you have not gone to. Your thoughts will be on full display when you are asked to solve problems. You must never do so without regard for the care of all the people you lead. Ask questions, avoid distractions and deception when providing guidance. Learn to love those who are far from God without condition. These are the acceptable practices for those who follow Jesus. 
We are to be in but not of the world. Gandhi asked us to evaluate the kind of world that emerges when we accept wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, science without humanity, knowledge without character, politics without principle, commerce without morality, and worship without sacrifice. Is it possible to remember that the word disciple means learner? And in this present time, there is much for us to learn if we are to lead well. Jesus tells his disciples to expect times of deep trauma and division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, two against three and three against two. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Pay attention to these clues, especially when interpreting this present time. Serene Jones tells us trauma is a wound or an injury inflicted upon the body by an act of violence. You are being sent out as wounded healers who look for clues to heal the wounds in others. You will be asked to teach others how to heal while you yourself are healing. Generational trauma won't be healed quickly as there are bodies of people who have experienced unrelenting violence across generations. The list of casualties, even when they are ethnically characterized, categorized, are still too long to name. Unrelenting generational violence has been inflicted upon our indigenous, black, Latino, and Asian sisters and brothers. As people come to you expecting to hear how they can be healed from these deep generational wounds, remember that their injuries are not just physical, but also emotional, mental, and spiritual. They will need you to recognize the signs, name the causes, and hear from your lips that God is concerned about how they are being mistreated and stripped of their basic human rights. What clues will you point to as you preach, teach, and lead them? What will be your embodied witness before them? Can you be a Nathan? who intercedes on behalf of a husband unjustly murdered for the personal gratification of someone in power in our season of hashtag Me Too? Will you be called to be a Mordecai who reminds those who have favor with powerful people to use it to relieve the systemic oppression of specific people groups who are targeted in this era of racial targeting? Can you be a Boaz who instructs your workers to let the poor glean from your fields in their time of economic need? The mysterious clues for healing generational wounds are in plain sight and within reach for everyone who belongs to the Lord. The essential task of theologians today is to avoid discipling people in a siloed gospel. When traumatized people carry burdens, they are searching to connect the clues. I invite you to preach like Jesus and highlight the oppressive injustices perpetrated by the empire. You are being sent out to disciple people in, in how to use their spiritual practices against the evils of the empire, just as Jesus did in his ministry. Serene Jones writes that often in Christianity, we have not focused on the task of understanding historical trauma, but rather we've lifted out of it and abstracted from it belief statements that hover above the reality of what these stories are narrating. There are real questions that people hold about how God is present with us when violent acts 
are perpetrated upon us. As the resonant theologian, you will need to not only name the causes of these violent acts, but also to help people experience how different the story can become when we are fully formed in Christ's image. Help people reimagine our world in light of God's vision for all of creation. We preach a mysterious word about a mysterious God who is working out a mysterious plan. And I agree with Michelle Obama when she says, if you are afraid to use your voice, then give up your seat at the table. Jesus' words means discipleship compels us to speak up and make hard choices. Christian discipleship will disturb and reorder all of life and every relationship we form in it. No one who hears and considers Jesus' words should ever feel misled about the fact that there will be a cost to our discipleship, especially those who are being sent out to lead. Jesus now turns his attention to the crowd and tells them, you too have work to do. It's not the same work as those who lead, but it is intentional work that must be done. He says to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say it's going to rain, and it does. When you see the south wind blow, you say it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it you don't know how to interpret this present time? People will hear a weather forecast and rearrange their plans for that day. Why is it that people can hear you proclaim that Jesus is coming back and not be open to the Holy Spirit's formation? If they change their plans and what they wear based on a weather report, we need leaders who can give warnings on how important it is for us to interpret the times that we are in. Jesus is coming, and the time of his return is drawing near. This should alter how we encounter, engage, participate with others in this world. Jesus has been teaching with parables about the way that the kingdom of God works, and the crowds didn't get it. You preach this coming kingdom, and people won't get you either. The problem, problem usually is not that people are unable to interpret the signs of the times, but more that they are unwilling to do so. It's interesting that Jesus uses the word hypocrite because the root of that meaning of that word is interpreter or actor. And just as an actor gets into character to interpret his role, so a hypocrite interprets the weather but acts as if they don't possess the uh, talent to understand the signs of our current state of affairs. Now is the time for all who lead to wake up. You are being sent to help people take off the blinders and see who God sees in the way God sees them. You are being sent out during a time when repentance must blow around our world. We need people to be shaken out of their complacency, their complicity, their hypocrisy, their willingness to act one way in public and be someone else in private, their unwillingness to change anything in order to maintain the status quo. Shirley Chisholm reminds us that service is the rent that all of us pay for room on this earth. It's time to serve those who have been forgotten and those who are unwelcomed. Connect the clues and evaluate the kind of people we are currently producing through our discipleship practices. 
It's time to realize that the weather is shifting and we must be able to prepare God's people for the storm that is brewing. Every day that Jesus walked the roads that would bring him to Jerusalem, he knew that it would lead to an unjust trial, to a torturous crown of thorns, to his innocent crucifixion. Jesus knew what lay ahead for him and it distressed him greatly. Yet every day he still healed the sick, still fed the hungry, still taught the crowds, still proclaimed the good news. He still showed tenderness to the lepers, still welcomed children, still took compassion on those society had rejected, still nurtured his disciples, still spent time alone with his father, still stayed on mission. We may be challenged by the mysterious work of Jesus' division, but it reverberates throughout the New Testament, and it should be our model for discipleship today. We are not called to participate in the divisive tactics of this world. We are called to the gospel's embodiment of division. We live in a way and for a time where there is opposition from within and division from without. The radical inbreaking of God's kingdom upsets the natural order in this fallen world, and with each new conversion, there will be more division. Baldwin reminds us that we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and the denial of my humanity and right to exist. People are angry. They are traumatized. They are hurting, depressed, and confused. They are ready to give up, and some are ready to snap. You must not be afraid to address the topics they will need to talk about. You are called to lead for such a time as this. Teach others God's plan for turning life around through conviction, confession, and repentance. It is in our turning back to God that gospel divisions will emerge. Each time we choose God's plan for our life, the world is turned right side up again. The divisions Jesus brings works in mysterious ways. It calls for an embodied discipleship that creates opportunities for growth. It doesn't diminish. It never rejects others. It doesn't kill, steal, destroy, or oppress. God interrupts our days with visible clues on how we are called to live and heal one another. One vis visible clue will lie in our ability to teach others how conviction leads to confession and not apology. See, an apology is usually offered when someone is caught, not necessarily sorry, and can be offered without admission for the offense that has been done. It will sound like, I'm truly sorry for anything I may have said that you might have been offended by. You are being called to call people to confession. Confession is an admission that emerges from conviction. It names and takes responsibility for the act of the offense. It would sound like, I'm truly sorry. What I did was wrong and it hurts you. What do I need to do to make it right between us? Dr. King reminds us that the time is always right to do what is right. You are being sent out in this Kairos moment to become so that you will be able to do what is right. The world is waiting for you. Teach others to become more like Christ, surrender to the Holy Spirit, accepting God's vision for this world so that they might be able to know the right thing to do. And when they do what is right, teach them 
that there will be a cost for their discipleship. You are being sent out to preach well. Choose relevant passages in the word of God, allowing people to be formed by the power of God's spirit. Be bold and confident that God has called you to continue the work of turning the world right side up. You are being sent out to teach well. Connect the text to the lived realities of the people you are called to lead, allowing the truth on the biblical page to change their hearts. You are being sent out to lead well. Create the vision that clearly separates your practice and engagement, your posture and behavior from the practices that are being demonstrated in this fallen and broken world. You are being sent out to care well. Create communal opportunities of listening and learning from the lived reality of the most vulnerable and most depressed people who are entrusted to your care. You have waited for this moment and now it is here. And now the world is waiting for you. Engage in ministry for God's glory and neighbor's good. Believe like Maya Angelou that hate has caused a lot of problems in this world, but it has yet to solve one. Listen to the Fannie Lou Hamers in your community who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Don't give in to the temptation to ignore the signs of the time because it's uncomfortable and painful or simply because you're tired of doing good. Don't refuse to interpret the signs and don't continue to live as if nothing were happening. Go forth, engage the world that is emerging. God's new world is bursting forth the future belongs to the reign of God. Jesus is coming back with all power in heaven and on earth. Go out, speak up, find good trouble as leaders who have been called and set apart. The Lord will open doors. The Lord will make a way. The Lord will provide you with the wisdom that you will need. And I will leave you with these words of Shirley Chisholm, who said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. A tangible act of remembering God's faithfulness to us is a renewing of our baptismal vows. They illuminate for us the reality of God's grace, prevenient and preserving. Grace that renews like a cup of cold water in the dryness of our doubts. Grace that reminds us of God's amazing love for us in the midst of our most immediate struggles. Grace that walks with us so that when we stumble, we get bruised, but not broken. For in this water is life. With this water, we are washed. Through this water, we are nurtured into maturity. It is this water of life that flows from the very source of life, God, the creator. I invite you to join me in the renewal of your baptismal vows. Do you intend to continue in the covenant of God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word and participate in the sacraments? And do you intend to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed? to seek Christ and serve him in all people and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, please say, we do. 
remember your baptism and be thankful. Please join me in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. As we begin with the common vows of order ministry, I invite all permanently credentialed clergy viewing the service this evening to listen and respond in a renewal of their own vows. Friends, in the presence of God and with this gathering, you have declared in the words of the Apostles' Creed those things most surely believed among us from the beginning. This is the faith on which you were examined, being called to the ministry of the Evangelical Covenant Church. You will now have that call confirmed by prayer and the laying on of hands according to apostolic tradition, setting you apart as teachers, missionaries, ministers of the word, and shepherds of the flock. We also invite those whose ordinations are being transferred to declare in the presence of God and with your sisters and brothers your commitment to this trust and responsibility. Do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? If so, say, I do. Do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct? If so, say, I do. Do you believe that you are truly called by God and the Church to serve in this office of ministry? If so, say, I do. Will you be diligent in your reading and study of the Holy Scriptures and seek the knowledge of those things that make you stronger and more able ministers of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will with the help of God. Will you seek to live in conformity with Christ and his teachings so that you may be a faithful witness to Christ crucified and risen and a wholesome example for all God's people in the way you speak and behave and in your love, faith, and purity? If so, answer, I will with the help of God. Will you submit to the church's discipline pledging your loyalty to the Evangelical Covenant Church and to its mission? And will you promise to follow the ethical principles for covenant ministers in the governance of our common life? If so, answer, I will, with the help of God. May the Lord, who has given you the will to do these things, give you the grace and power to perform them. Amen. President Winrich, there are 10 candidates for transfer of ordination this evening. These candidates have been examined in accord with the requirements of the church and approved by the church 
through the Board of Audit Ministry and the annual meeting as duly qualified for the exercise of the ministry. We praise God for the vows you've spoken and the traditions that have nourished and blessed you on the way and for your faithfulness to Christ Church. We now receive your vows and ask God's richest blessing as you serve in gospel ministry in the Evangelical Covenant Church. We welcome you with joy and great hope. God, I thank you for these men and women who are transferring their ordination to the Evangelical Covenant Church. This is a sacred trust between a church and his ministers. We pray that they will faithfully fulfill the ministry entrusted to them to shepherd your people. You began a good work in them as they served in other churches and denominations. They served well. Now they will finish what you started in them with the Evangelical Covenant Church. Father, in a world that is divided, in a world full of hate, you call us to be models of unity and models of love. So Father, with the same message Paul gave to the saints at Ephesus, I give to these candidates. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Father, use your servants to touch and influence the lives of thousands. And may those thousands go out and touch the lives of thousands more. These are your servants, Father. I thank you for them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As you are given Bibles and vested with stoles, hear these words. Receive this book. Here are the words of eternal life. Learn from them, live in them, and proclaim Christ, the living word. Receive this stole as a sign of the yoke of Christ and your ordination being recognized and received by the Evangelical Covenant Church. President Wenrick, there are two candidates for consecration to missionary service, one for commissioning, and nine being ordained to word and service. They have been examined in accord with the requirements of the church and approved by the church through the board of the ordered ministry and the annual meeting as duly qualified for the exercise of their calling. Dear friends, in response to God's call, and after spiritual and educational preparation, you have come to take holy orders. 
having confessed your faith and spoken your vows in matters of faith and holy intent, I now call upon you to make your solemn promise in the presence of God and in this company of witnesses. Will you who are being consecrated undertake to be faithful missionaries using your unique gifts to participate in God's mission in the world, witnessing to the good news of Jesus Christ and working in partnership with your brothers and sisters in Christ's service, that God's love may be known to the ends of the earth? If so, answer, I will with the help of God. Will you, who are being commissioned to staff ministries, use your unique gifts to build up the Church of Jesus Christ by serving collegially with your ordained sisters and brothers, participating in the spiritual leadership of your call? If so, answer, I will, with the help of God. Will you, who are being ordained to word and service, undertake to be a faithful pastor to those whom you are called to serve, teaching in accord with the Holy Scriptures, caring for God's people, whatever their needs, and working in partnership with your sisters and brothers in Christ's service, that God's love may be known in all that you do? If so, answer, I will with the help of God. The Lord God pour upon you the Holy Spirit for the office and work now committed to you through the laying on of hands. Kneel before God and lift up your hearts in prayer. Will you please bow your heads with me as we pray for these candidates? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you in this moment with gratitude, in humility. We are in awe of your love and grace at work in the world around us as you draw people to yourself, as you transform and restore life. Tonight, we entrust these servants kneeling before you into your care, each one called by the Evangelical Covenant Church, set apart to pastor in a myriad of settings, to lead in mission, to equip and build up your body, for you call all who follow you to be part of your kingdom work. As each consecrated missionary, commissioned pastor, and those ordained to word and service have spoken their sacred vows, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. Be vision and strength, refuge and rescuer, joy, compassion, and kindness in their lives. Each woman and man before us have responded to Jesus' call to come follow, and I will send you out. May they live each day in response to your claim on their lives. Draw them close to you, to your transforming love, peace, and hope. Grant each one courage that they may be faithful to you, Jesus. Meet them in the joys and struggles of their particular contexts. Fill these pastors with everything they need, spirit, soul, mind, and body, as they pour themselves into the kingdom mission set before them. Lord God, we ask that you strengthen relationships with family and friends on their journey, protect their most intimate connections, that each individual may be surrounded by mutual relationships that glorify you. We commit each servant to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. To those of you taking the vow of consecration, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and by the authority of the Evangelical Covenant Church, I now declare you duly consecrated to your sacred service as missionaries. To those of you taking the vow of commissioning, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and by the authority of the Evangelical Covenant Church, I now declare you duly commissioned to your office of ministry. To those of you taking the vow of word and service, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the head of the church, and by the authority of the Evangelical Covenant Church, I now declare you duly ordained to the office of word and service, committing to you to share in the ministry of word and sacrament, and taking up the yoke of service, leading within your specialization. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As you are given Bibles and vested with stoles, hear these words. Receive this book. Here are the words of eternal life. Learn from them, live in them, and proclaim Christ, the living word. Receive this stole as a sign of the yoke of Christ and of the vows you have spoken. President Renrick, there are 77 candidates for ordination to the Office of Word and Sacrament this evening. They have been examined in accord with the requirements of the church and approved by the church through the Board of the Ordered Ministry and the annual meeting as duly qualified for the exercise of their calling. Dear friends, in response to God's call and after spiritual and educational preparation, you have come to be ordained to the office of word and sacrament. Having confessed your faith and spoken your vows in matters of faith and holy intent, I now call upon you to make your solemn promise in the presence of God and in this company of witnesses. Will you undertake to be a faithful pastor, caring for God's people, whatever their needs, nourishing them in the preaching and teaching of the word, administering the holy sacraments, bearing rule in the church, and serving with the love and authority of Christ in bringing redemption and reconciliation? If so, answer, I will, with the help of God. The Lord God pour upon you the Holy Spirit for the office and work of the ministry now committed to you through the laying on of hands. Kneel before God and lift up your hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these men and women who have offered themselves up for your service to serve this present age and to bless their neighbor while glorifying your name. Lord, we pray this evening that you bless these individuals who are being ordained into word and sacrament. May you bless their ministries and also bless their families. Keep them resilient, Lord, and bless the work of their hands. When they grow discouraged, God, be with them, strengthen them, affirm them. Lord, we thank you for this night where the call is answered 
the hard work is behind them, and now ahead of them is a life of ministry. May it be a fruitful life of ministry. May it be a time of seeing so many come to Christ, children born, husband and wives raising families. Lord, we pray that you bless their ministry, make it powerful and effective to serve this present age. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and by the authority of the Evangelical Covenant Church, I now declare you duly ordained to the office of word and sacrament, committing to you to preach the word, administer the sacraments, share the yoke of service, and bear the rule in the church. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you are given Bibles and vested with stoles, hear these words. Receive this book. Here are the words of eternal life. Learn from them, live in them, and proclaim Christ, the living word. Receive this stole as a sign of the yoke of Christ and of the vows you have spoken. We praise God for your commitment to serve Christ and his church. Serve patiently, cheerfully, and with compassion, remembering that the work you are called to is God's work, and that it is done in God's name to God's glory. Follow Christ, whose servant you are. Remember, you are marked as persons who proclaim Christ crucified and risen, and you must be prepared to be what you proclaim. Serve Christ simply and willingly, and let your joy in Christ overcome all discouragement. Have no fear. Be humble, yet bold, and full of hope.
all candidates, please join me in giving the benediction to those around you. Extend your right hand and let us say the benediction together. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.